Good morning again, everyone. We're just going to start our panel, Empowering Our Future Eco Leaders, a panel on sustainable initiatives in schools. I understand everyone is going to continue to look at the exhibitions, but maybe in hushed tones so we can hear from our wonderful panellists this morning. I'll go and join them now and introduce them. Welcome to our panel this morning. Uh, as I said, looking at empowering our future eco leaders. And we're thrilled today to have representatives, student representatives from Campbellwell Grammar. Let me introduce you to our uh, panelists today. We have Henry uh, from Campbellwell Grammar. And Henry has also been awarded the Young Burundara Environment Award for his work. And he's going to be speaking about grassroots action from a personal perspective. And welcome to Ned from Campbell Grammar as well, uh, who's going to speak about the many programs that Campbell Grammar is looking uh, at in terms of sustainability. And I've had the pleasure to visit Campbell Grammar uh, and see Ned in particular and some of the amazing work they're doing around solar panels, um, around sustainability when it comes to batteries, and even looking at some of their biodiversity options when it comes to the work they're doing with bees. And of course, heading their uh, sustainability team is Will Hone, who is a teacher and the head of sustainability at Campbell Grammar, who's going to speak specifically to the electrification in the school and Campbell Grammar's journey to net zero emissions. And finally, uh, Holly Fields is the education liaison for Electrify Burundara, and is going to speak more broadly about education and electrification. And Holly also is at Strathcona, uh, my former school, and uh, is going to speak to some of her journey through that experience. Now, this is a really important panel today, listening to our future leaders. And as someone who's just taken on the shadow education portfolio, it's going to be really important, as I think, to the future about how we build sustainability programs into our education system and into our curriculum. So, Henry, I might start with you. If you can talk to us a little bit about your grassroots activity and from a personal perspective and how you're here with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, my uh, grassroots activity that I have started was, is the ISP, the Interschool Sustainability Partnership. Around year 11, I realised that students go through school, they come up with their own ideas and they leave before they can fully be realised and before they can be shared with all the other schools in the area. So I decided to organise with other schools in the Burundara area, as w um, if they were interested, as well as um, Geelong Grammar School, uh, to share ideas and to work together on projects. So twice a term, delegates from the sustainability groups in and around the Burundara area come together to discuss what they've been doing lately and how we'd like to work together. So some of the examples of what we've been doing were um, Melbourne Girls College organised a tree planting day where um, we all came together and we planted trees alongside the Yarra down by their school campus. And we've also been invited along to an, a tour of state-run deforestation organised by the Australian Conservation Foundation. So what I've really loved um, and what I've learnt through this experience was when you want to, when you see a problem and you want to uh, address it, first you, you've kind of got to imagine what you want to see done and what you want to see changed. And so once you've got that imagination, once you've got that dream, the next step is to um, to find out what it takes to put it in place. So I call that the research phase. So that for me, that was um, uh, coming up with a draft outline for how the ISP would run with, uh, together with Ned here. We were sitting there on a whiteboard writing everything up. And eventually, when we had our draft resolution together and we shared it with different groups to uh, around the school and my parents as well to make sure it was all um, ready to send out to schools. The next step was to communicate because when you, re when you work together with other people on a cause that, that um, interests everyone unique, uh, um, in the same way, it kind of grows legs and starts walking on its own. So we reached out to the schools in general. We didn't have specific contacts, 
but they, um, they put us through to the people we needed to talk to. And everyone was really interested in the same um, goals. So everyone wanted to try and work together and extend what they'd been doing on their own. Some people had been making gardens. Camel Grammar had done a lot around, around waste and electrification, trying to reach net zero. And together, we've, um, we've found a lot of new ideas and different ways that other people have done the same thing as us that might be better and ways that we can all like combine our ideas and, and share them. And the fourth step is to actually realise it. And I felt like this might be the most daunting step because now you've got everything you want to do, you actually have to go out and put it in practice. And this is the moment where you wonder if your dream will never actually come true. But you'll never know until you actually go and take the steps that you've planned. And so for, that, that, for us that was going out to Baldwin Library and meeting for the first time people I'd never seen before and deciding whether we liked the um, outline that we'd put together and if this was something that we all shared an interest in and something that we wanted to do. And I'm happy to say that yes, it was, because now we've had uh, six meetings, six meetings of the ISP, two different activities that we've run and uh, we're re gearing up for our next meetings of Term 4. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Henry. That's a really fascinating insight into how you saw a problem and actually tried to look at solutions to that and putting your mind to it and working with your fellow uh, uh, peers to make sure that as a team you could come together and try and put forward a solution. I'm just going to ask again, we've got some fantastic young leaders up here. So everyone looking at the exhibits, if we could just do it in hushed tones, that would be fantastic. And I might ask any Enviro uh, Electrify Burundara people just to walk around the room and encourage that a little bit. Uh, next up, we have Ned, as I said, from Camberwell Grammar as well. And I had the pleasure to meet Ned when I visited the school earlier this year to have a look at your sustainability program and to have a look at your garden in particular and some of the initiatives in place around the school. Ned, tell us about some of the, the programs at Camberwell Grammar and the role of the students in that. Yep, sure. Thanks, Jess, and thanks, everyone, for having me here. Um, so yeah, I'm from Camel Grammar with Henry, um, and that can be really good because you know I can easily find Henry. We can um, catch up, share sustainability ideas. We can work on them, and that's the whole idea on um, mobilising uh, individuals to work together and towards a project that has a sustainable outcome. Um, and you know, us two, we just go crazy over certain projects. Um, so, yeah, basically, we've done a lot of projects and it, it's hard to pick out just a few of them. You know, when I just think about it, I get really excited about it. There's a lot of things that any of us could just go on about for days. But um, one thing I'm really passionate about, and I'm sure Henry is too, is um, some films we made, some videos. Um, for our school community and basically the story behind that was I joined the sustainability group a few years ago and I was just really keen to do some media, some, some videos because I know how fun and engaging watching, watching something can be and how it can be a really good way of informing people and if you do it in the right way, if you do it, if it's a bit funny, it's a bit engaging then the outcome is really amazing. So. Um, we basically put our heads together and went, went around filming a lot of skits and um, give, basically finding a lot of information we could give to our school community. Um, and along the way, including, including a lot of teachers and students and getting them involved. And even if they weren't super interested in sustainability, um, we made them <laughs> interested in sustainability. We um, basically were able to involve them and. Um, open up their minds to something new and they, they loved it um, and they were excited to be part of that project and um, we were really happy with it. Um, but it's not just within our school community and I think that's a big thing to think about when we're looking at sustainability from a school perspective. It's not about in school, it's about uh, inter, inter school, 
about connecting with other schools, other groups alike. And, um, you know, Henry's talked about the Interschool uh, Sustainability Partnership, and that was a great way that we could bond with a lot of other like-minded schools and environmental groups from those schools to work collabor collaboratively together um, on, a, on, a, on a shared goal, on a shared vision. And, um, you know, that, that didn't just come from nothing. That started with um, a few school visits. So um, we had Strathcona over, we had Campbell Girls over, um, and we made visits to other schools. And that was, that was really good. I, I think I'm surprised it hadn't started earlier, but when it, when it did, it was great. It was great to connect with these other schools, learn what they were doing, and ideally bring back those ideas back to our, uh, our own school. Um, just one thing off the top of my head that I learned through what Strathcona was doing, they did a second-hand clothing store. And that's, that sounded really cool to me. We, um, we, we haven't done that at Campbell Grammar before and it seemed quite interesting. And um, yeah, so, and then we were able to exchange ideas and um, yeah, it was quite, quite rewarding. And besides that, besides this uh, sharing of thoughts and uh, feedback, we, were, we could actually work on a project together. And, that, and that, that's really um, significant, that we were able to come together, different schools on the same project. We could um, pull resources together, put all our brains together um, for the same project. And that's really useful. You don't, you don't want to be doing these kind of things isolated. You, um, you want as much help as you can. And, um, you know, seeking, reaching out to new people, um, for it is um, quite a good way to go. And that's been really beneficial. It's contributed to the ISP. Um, and yeah, we're in a lot better place than we were going back a couple of years ago because we've now started building a community and that's really good for getting action to, um, for getting action along because you can't, you can't do it alone. You, you need as much help as you can, I think. So um, yeah, but um, yeah, it's quite interesting what, 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 what we can do if we put our minds to it, um, especially the students. I mean, a lot of the projects we've achieved, a lot of the outcomes, a lot of, they've been student-led. I think um, the, the, the one that just pops off my head that I have to mention before we leave here is our solar project at um, Camel Gamma, where we um, basically went about installing solar panels on our roof to provide for energy. And that started, that started with a student interest um, students being keen, and they took it to the executive, uh, to the business manager, proposing a 100 kilowatt energy um, project, and that basically got uh, converted, if you like, into um, 888 kilowatts of energy. So that that small project, to begin with, got turned into a large scale thing because everyone was just so keen for it so interested in implementing it at school. Um, and yeah, 2,600 solar panels, 36 inverters, it's a huge project, um, and just a really good shift to moving away from fossil fuel energy sources and into something a bit more um, greener. And um, yeah, I'll just have to think about what kind of stats are there. I think we're getting about more than a third of our um, daily use is powered by uh, the solar panels. It's nearly 50% they generate in total, but all that uh, pesky uh, weekend energy that you're getting that you're not using, um, we're able to sell that back to the grid. So um, we're, not, we're, not, we're not there at 100%. We, there's limited roof space, isn't there? But um, yeah, yeah we've, we've used up all the roof space we can to, for, for that you know, 2,000 plus panels. But um, you know, we're not using we can't use it all on, uh, we can't get it all from solar energy. But here's, here's the niche bit. That, all that un, untapped energy that you know, we have to fill in, we're actually getting that completely from renewable sources. So um, you know, we've got a contract with the company where we can just fill our shortage of energy from renewable sources like wind and solar. Um, and the bit I always get excited about is it was cheaper for us to use renewable energy than it was to coal or gas. So, and I think that's amazing because, you know, you might come across these arguments for price against renewable, but no, it was, it was 
a bit cheaper for us to use these green energy sources, and that's just fantastic. And it really provides you that kind of real hope of, um, yeah, of, of the future and what's to come. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ned. I think you can hear the passion in Ned's voice there. And I think the, a really important point you made was the ability to connect with other schools um, and learn from other schools. You don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel every time, but look at what other schools are doing and then adopt that or share that knowledge as well. And when I was uh, visiting you at Camwell Grammar, I saw the solar panels and the uh, interactive display you had that told the students or the teachers at any one time how much energy, how much electricity is being generated by your own panels. And it's terrific to see that give the students such a buy-in and an understanding of the sustainability work. So congratulations on that. Will, we might turn to you next. And you've been largely driving Campwell Grammar's uh, transition to net zero. Talk us through that program and how you work to bring not only the students together on the journey, but how did you bring the broader school community, the board, the management, and how did they see the benefits of this? Uh, thanks, Jess. Look, I'm really lucky at, at Campbell in that I, I work at a school that has, since 2015, said yes. When I wanted to start up a student group, sure. When I took some students to make a presentation about the solar, they didn't just say yes, they went larger. In 2021, when I took a presentation to the school council about going net zero and committing to be net zero by 2030, I got a round of applause by the school council, which I'm assured is the first time there's been a round of applause in a council meeting. Um, it's, it's a really, really positive school as, as far as taking steps towards becoming more sustainable um, goes. But I'm really interested in schools in general and speaking to this idea of networking. I'm really interest, interested in the idea of education as a lever and education as a, as, a, as a vast organ in our society and what we can achieve by addressing the physical assets in the education system across the state. So, for example, if you were to install a solar array on every school, you would it would be equivalent of producing a massive power plant across the state. It would be distributed around the state, and the schools themselves would be saving huge amounts of money, which would then go into their coffers, and we often hear that schools are underfunded. So this would be a project which would cut emissions, provide money to, it, to the schools, into state schools, and would also provide localised data which could then be, implement, uh, then be used in the curriculum so that students would be studying data which was relevant to them and to the institutions where they're studying. So it wins on every level. And so I'm really interested in looking at education and at schools as a hub and at education as a, as a, as a lever. So a school as a hub, for example, would be to say, if we're making this transition, can we offer, if we're transitioning our hot water services to electricity, is it possible to enter a deal with a company where we can offer a bulk buying discount to everyone in our school community? And so to see a school as a hub, as a central point, and to see education as a lever, I think is a really, really interesting way. And it's helped me, help guide my, my philosophy and my thought with regards to Campbell Grammar, but also with regards to spreading information with other schools. Um, and if you get me started on the networks with other schools, we'll be here all day. <laughs> Thanks very much, Will. I think it's a really interesting insight into how sort of the physical locations of schools can be part of this journey. And to uh, congratulations on the work and the passion you have at Campbell Grammar. I know it's been years of work and we might come back later to talking about some of the um, the projects themselves. I know that we spoke about the, the waste project we were there and how that was a journey over many years and the intricacies of some of these changes that we don't quite understand from the outset and how that plays out on the ground. But Holly, I might come to you now. Keen to get your perspective both from um, your role in, in an educator in a school but also as part of Electrify Burundara and the role you have here to bring together electrification with education. It would be great to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Jess. Well, I think the panel has already articulated it really well, but united we are better. United we can make change. And I've been in education for about a decade now, teaching humanities, 
And with this topic of electrify Burundara and electrification comes two major points. There's the education piece. So our young kids, they want to know about what waste is, what renewable energy is, how to grow your own produce. There's so many parts of the piece here that come into education. But then there's also the bigger picture of helping the planet, um, improving our climate and really making change. And for the last four years, I've been at Strathcona and I have worked really closely with Campbellwell Grammar as well. But I've been a VCE geography teacher. We've been learning about things like natural disasters, which have a huge impact on our own country here in Australia. But having taught hundreds and thousands of students, and I know, Jess, you'll be working with you know, hundreds of thousands of students in the state this year. Our young people are really clever, and you've heard from two of them today, and I continue to be in awe by their passion and their um, endurance in this idea that we can make a better future, and, and it's their future as well. And we all in this room today play a part in that. Uh, at Strathcona, I led the environment group, and I led uh, their sustainability committee as well. We had a range of young people there that wanted to deliver projects. So. We did have an op shop looking at how you can reduce the issue of fast fashion. We looked at uh, fixing up our waste and ensuring that our labels on our bins were um, better reflecting what should go in each bin. Uh, but in terms of this Electrify Burundara, the last year I have had so much joy in meeting and engaging with schools and that's really my role. This is completely voluntary. Um, but, you know, I've got some expertise and, and the passion of being an educator to bring to this. And there's 79 schools in Burundara. And every one of those places is a remarkable place. They're all doing different things. But back to what I was saying, united, we can move together ahead for the future, um, which, which is so important. And so today here at the Expo, we have four schools that are here, which I think is incredible. Um, but this year I visited about 15 and had really um, solid conversations with what schools are doing. And schools are at different points in this journey. Campbellwell Grammar, they're 100% renewable. They've got a really strong student body and I believe we have so much to learn from them and that's why you know, I asked Will and the students to come up here today. But there's other schools doing great things. Campbellwell South, for example, have a really strong kitchen garden program and they have won lots of awards and have got grants to have solar panels and, and water tanks put on their campuses. Um, Campbellwell High School is down the front today and they're doing some wonderful things with science um, in their curriculum. Strathcona has provided some sustainable housing kits so that you can learn about insulation today and that's in the family activities area. Campbellwell Primary School has also donated some artwork on how they're engaging their young 10-year-olds, 8-year-olds, on um, sustainability and reusing items around them. And so I think just to speak to a few of those points today, um, our schools are doing great things in Burundara, but they can be better. And, you know, like Will said, I'd love to see solar panels on every single school roof. And, you know, some schools, they're struggling with um, the resources or the time or the expertise. And so um, Resource Smart Schools is a really great place to start and I know we'll use that. We used it at Strathcona as well. It's free. It's very step-by-step -step working through um, what you can do and it is student-led. You know, um, we've got a couple other teachers here today. I know Campbellwell Girls Grammar, Anna Clarkson is here and I've done a lot of work with her. Um, and so we really want the students to be at the forefront of this as well and so that the teachers can take a back seat. Um, obviously supporting along the way. But yes, I'm really excited to be a part of Electrify Burundara. I'm really proud of the amazing people that are part of this, as I said, in a volunteer capacity. And if you are connected with a school today out there, those of you that are listening, I think we've got Trinity Grammar here as well. Um, please come and talk to us because we really want to connect with every school, engage with you, hear what you're doing and see how we can support you in the next step. And Jess, I look forward to working with you as well as um, Early Childhood and Education Minister and seeing what more we can do in this space of sustainability and really supporting schools to move forward to the next century. 
Thanks so much, Holly, and thank you for giving up your time to really contribute back into Electrify Burundara. I know recently I went to Chatham Primary where they launched their own community garden, and you know they launched it on a Saturday. They had parents and students and teachers there on the weekend because they were so passionate about the opportunities it provided, and I think we're seeing that right across Burundara and our. Uh, our schools, our kinders, uh, all of our education services are so much of who we are in this area and it's a wonderful way to connect with the community. We're going to open it up to questions shortly and we have a roving microphone over here. I might kick off with a couple of questions while we do that. Uh, Ned and Henry, you spoke uh, briefly about how to communicate with your fellow students about the importance of sustainability and get them involved. How important is it, and I know Ned, you spoke about sort of creating videos, how important is it to use different forms of media, whether that's social media, your internal channels at schools, to actually communicate the message and what opportunities are there to do that sort of beyond your own school community into that broader intra-school community that you spoke about? And maybe to both of our teachers on the panel uh, here today, from a, a broader state perspective, thinking about sustainability and electrification, where do you think there are opportunities for government to buy into this? Where do you think there are opportunities to buy this into the curriculum, uh, but also the more practical efforts on the ground? I know, Will, you spoke about the, the physical opportunity of school assets, and there are schools locally that want to install solar panels, but their roofing structures won't allow it, and you know that's another reason to invest and to improve our local schools and have those capital upgrades. But in more of the education sense, do you think there are opportunities for government to buy in? So I might kick off with those couple of questions while we get some from the audience. Um, yep, I think I can field uh, just for communication related questions. So when it comes to sustainability, we've learnt this, well, I think the hard way that communication is everything. It's everything about informing people if you want to change their actions and their, um, their thoughts and their attitudes to sustainability. And it's about making sure that um, the actions you do is are well, uh, well informed and people understand, understand why, why you want to do these things. You know, you, they've got to understand what you want to do, why you want to do it, and then how, how, how you want to do it. Um, and we found that, you know, at, at our school, you've, you've got to work really hard to um, engage people. And, and that's why we were driven to those videos, because we um, successfully managed to um, show them at assembly to a large crowd who had to sit there and watch it. And, uh, and it was great. And there was a great reception after that. And they were really uh, turned on and tuned, tuned on to the ideas that were presented in the video. But beyond that, there's like something simple as posters and advertising and just co what are you seeing as you move around the space, as you move around school? Because I think, I know everyone learns by different senses, but I think sight's a really powerful one because it's just you're walking and bang, there's a poster about what goes in the FOGO bin or what goes in the landfill bin, what goes in the recycling bin, something as simple as that. But in the changing world we're in, maybe we have to take different forms. Um, Jess, I know you mentioned social media, and that is certainly an option we can look at. I think all, all, all companies and groups are moving to social media as the younger generation um, you know, are much more on their phones and checking out information through that way. So that's something to take advantage of. Um, but it's a, ch it's a challenging, ongoing effort on how, how are we going to let people know what's going on? How are we going to communicate people? Because if, if you've got good communication, then it, you can just build on that, and yeah. And I think I found, um, I mean, Ned kind of covered everything, but I, I've also mentioned the things that don't work as well, which are, um, we've got a school notification system that's on, online on, as a website, and we've found we get very little um, reaction when we put stuff out there, because that's not really where students are looking for stuff. We're, as Ned said, when you're moving around the environment that you want to be in, that's when you really find messages and connect to them. So, yeah, having those f physical things that Ned mentioned, the films and the posters, as opposed to um, a short message on deeds, and sometimes e emails as well, they don't really connect with the students as much. 
that's really um, the f the physical connection is the best way to communicate. Thank you so much, and I think there's a clear message, Mr. Horn, about some of the communication options um, in the school. Might uh, ask you guys to respond to the question from earlier while we get a couple of questions. Yeah, look, Je Jess, I, does that work? Yeah, Jess, I'd say that. Uh, for every school, I can understand that you might not be, the, the roof space is different for every school, but every school has got a waste profile, for example. Uh, when we first started looking into waste at Campbell Grammar, we were producing six cubic metres of landfill every day. Um, I hit the roof when I saw that and then started walking around and putting in a commingled recycling system. That was at a cost in infrastructure to put out the bins, um, but then once you've got them out and you, you do have this massive communication program that Ned and, Ned and Henry were talking about, but you have an avenue to cut the waste and then you have landfill is the most expensive form of, of waste to get rid of. If Once you bring in paper and green waste and co-mingled recycling, they're reducing your landfill bill, they're reducing your environmental impact and they are something, they are producing data, which you can then, which then fits in really well with, for example, the, the geography curriculum. So it's a matter of finding that low hanging fruit, which you can address very quickly. And I would suggest at state education, at a state education level, working with the waste providers, working with the schools, and then working with the curriculum so that there is communication through the classroom, there's waste providers who can deal with the waste. There's a network of rubbish. We know where it's all going. You can get that system up and running within 24 months and it will significantly reduce the amount of landfill that, educa that the education system produces. So it's on all fronts. It's not one front or the other front. It's a, it's a holistic sort of approach. I definitely agree with Will. There's so many touch points in the curriculum. And um, a couple of years ago, I did an audit of our curriculum, trying to map it in the art and the science, um, primary and secondary, as to where the education can come behind um, sustainability and electrification. But um, your other question, Jess, you mentioned about infrastructure within a school and support. Um, a, a couple of years ago, something as simple as energy saving lights. Um, I mean, t teachers are often with students after class, you know, helping them, supporting them with their learning. And, you know, it takes a second to turn off the light, but often they get left on. And so something as simple as energy saving lights can make a huge difference um, within a school. And so I, I think uh, there's a number of schools that do have them, but there's also plenty that don't. And, you know, t I definitely agree with what you said about schools that certainly might have issues um, with their spacing or um, their roof infrastructure not being able to support solar panels yet. So there's a number of issues there, um, but I think yeah, small steps in order to uh, reach a, a bigger goal. Fantastic. Sorry, just, just, I'd, I'd just like to also add to what you're saying that there are some schools I hear about, like we have a building management system which is a, a system, an automated system, which will ensure that all of the lights are switched off and the air conditioning switches off at a certain time of the day. It's a very complicated system that we've got, but it's, it's, I've heard of other teachers, um, I think, um, at, at state schools where there's one teacher who has to walk around the school at five o'clock on a Friday to make sure that air conditioners aren't left on all weekend. This is a massive cost. And I'd like to think in this day and age, that we could have an automated system across the state system that meant that your classrooms, heating, cooling and lights automatically switch off. They're never on all weekend. That's a, that's a big thing in the state system. So just to what you're speaking about, infrastructure and systems that we can put in, system-wide systems, I think it's really interesting to think about. Fantastic. Well, I think we're going to take a question from the floor. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate Campbellville Grammar for the leadership they've shown in this space, um, particularly Mr Hone and Henry and Ned too. Um, given that there are parents, teachers, students here from a whole lot of different schools, um, some of which won't have started their um, electrification or sustainability journey much, 
what would you what would be your advice about how they should get started? What should be one of the first things they take on? Uh, the, the first step I would take would be to join Resource Smart Schools um, and start gathering the data on where your resource usage is and where your greatest gaps are. Um, for example, we've got a big water problem and we're, we're addressing that. Um, we saw that we had very high energy usage and one of the, the first projects we, we took on was the solar project. But you need to identify these problems first and Resource Smart Schools is a free um, and, su and supported through Sustainability Victoria program where you get educated. I'm an English and history teacher and I'm doing this. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's been a very steep learning curve, but they take you on the journey. So that would be my very first step. I think also um, finding the students and the staff who are passionate. Like, the students can connect to the students really well, and the, but the staff are just as important connecting to other staff members. And the ones who start it have to be the most passionate staff members because that is pretty infectious when you see someone who really cares about what they're doing. Uh, promoting that message, that's when you listen, that's when you try to find out what you can do yourself and that's a really good way to start spreading the message amongst the school to the people who are kind of interested and then to the whole school community. Going from passionate to kind of interested to everyone. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Henry. I, I want to ask um, Ned Henry about some of the programs you have specifically. And I, you know, I've seen firsthand and tasted the honey that Campbell Grammar produces. Maybe talk a little bit about the bees, the garden, um, the batteries that you've installed. Keen to hear some about the specific programs. Um, I might start with the bees and the garden because I was, back in year eight, the bees were my project that I brought to the school. Um, basically, every project that we start at Campbell Grammar is just an idea that someone is passionate about, something that they're interested in. And like Mr. Hone said, something that's amazing at Camberwell is that almost every project, if it has merit, it's accepted and it's supported. And I had a great team of staff supporting me because, of course, in Year 8, I had no idea about how to implement a project, how to talk to a school board, but they outlined every step that I needed to take. And from there, it was all about um, learning uh, as I said earlier with the grassroots things, the four steps, imagining, imagining having a beehive, researching what it takes, communicating to the people who can um, install a beehive for us, and finally going to, and speaking, taking action and speaking to that board about the beehives. It's that continuous four step process, finding those people who are passionate, going through that system and having those amazing uh, staff um, who can support you and guide you along the steps. And that's what we've seen with every, every uh, project at our school, in, like the garden, where we've had um, a few students that was also back in middle school. They wanted a place where they could learn about growing, um, growing their own produce and uh, kind of take, being um, more sustainable uh, in a culinary sense, I guess you could say. And just having that fourth step and that passion is what I've seen with a lot of projects. Well, um, I might just add that there's a huge variety when it comes to sustainability projects. I mean, we've gone from t just today, what, solar panels to bees to garden. Um, I could mention water. Water's a big thing when it comes to sustainability. Um, like rainwater tanks, if you're able to collect rainwater and reuse that rainwater, then you're being a lot more efficient, a lot more sustainable. I know we've got uh, tanks spread all around the school. I think it adds up to what, more than a million? Yeah, more than a million cubic, cubic litres of, of water that we can, we're able to collect and reuse. Um, and, and, and that's great. And you could look at something else like waste. And I know, I know we're all passionate about waste here. Um, we could um, dig around in that topic for days. But um, yeah, um, just simple things like introducing a recycling bin and then possibly introducing a compost bin or FOGO, you know, food and garden organics. Um, and that's a great project that could be implemented at schools and you can get a lot of student involvement in that um,
because I know I know it's not being done everywhere, um, and that's a great step in terms of just dealing with the waste issue under the sustainability banner. Ned, Ned if you don't mind, if, if I just jump in there, it's also on waste. There are a lot of programs that are really, really easy to introduce, like Mobile Muster. Um, we do e-waste and clothing recycling through SCR Group. These are very, very easy programs to start up. Mobile Muster is free. Um, e-waste and clothing recycling is free. So starting up programs like these in a school enables you to collect from that whole community that you can easily communicate to. And that's that concept that I, I mentioned earlier, the school is a hub as a central point for, you know, sometimes over a thousand families to bring their to bring their bits and pieces into. We've got another question from the floor. Congratulations, Camberwell Grammar. Um, I will um, say that I have joined the school recently, but Will, um, let's get back to electrification. Can we um, share with everyone one of the main success stories in getting uh, the business manager on board because I think schools can join RSS, we can have passionate students and Ned and Henry and Oscar and boys are here today, but without that level of business management investment and commitment with money from a school, um, it's a really important step. So could you please share that with everyone? Well, uh, solar really sells itself. Um, it's, if your school is, if the infrastructure is capable of of housing solar panels, they are going to pay for themselves. And the more you put in, the better it's going to work out. At Campbellwell Grammar, we make 48% of our annual usage from solar. 14% um, of that's exported to the grid. Uh, the 34%, about, so about a third of our power on our daily usage comes from the rooftops. That's saving us money. It's got a seven to nine year payback period, which the business heads found very attractive. But also, a school is a school. A school relies on the future. If there is no future, there is no point in education. You're just walking around in circles. So it's also quite an easy thing to sell to, to school executives and to school council, because if we're not investing in the future with regards to the climate, why are we bothering to teach kids? What's our point? Our whole purpose is the future, so, of course, we need to invest in the future. And that made a lot of sense. And then to get students themselves presenting to the school executive is another really, really strong resource. I think kids are often seen as, well, that's nice, now let the adults do the work. This is, this is, this is time for the big boys, all right? Look at these two kids. They're incredible. Henry is leading a whole network of schools to get together across, from across, even as far as Geelong. Um, if you look at the, the presentation which the students were making in 2016 to the school executive, it was mind-blowing. This was not kid stuff. This was kids stepping up and teaching the rest of us how we need to look towards the future. So I think it's, we can't rely on kids to do the job for us but we need to support and listen to kids and make them a part of our journey because it's their future as well as ours. Thank you, Will. And I think that's a great note to finish on. I might ask each of our panellists, starting with you, Holly, we'll work back this way, just to leave us with a final message, uh, anything you want to leave uh, the participants here today about electrification and education. Sure. Well, if you're a parent in this room or a grandparent even, what you're doing today being here to take steps to electrify your own home is part of the bigger school's picture as well. We want our kids to at home be learning, but also at school. And so I just want to thank you all for being here. And if you've got any questions about schools and the electrification journey, please come and talk to myself or any of the schools that are present here. We're always open to a conversation or visiting your school and seeing what more we can do to support you um, for a better future for our young people. Look, we, we've, got a, um, we, we've got a stall just down here. We're really, really happy to talk to people. That's why we're here. We want to share our experiences. We've been on this path since 2015. 
um, and we've got a commitment to be net zero by 2030. We are taking, uh, we've taken many steps. Some of them have been sideways steps, some of them have been, have been forward steps. We're really happy to share our journey and to, to share our experiences so that we can help other schools and institutions um, expedite a speedy process in, in getting to a, a positive future. Yep, okay, I won't get carried away with this. I'll be really simple. So I know I like looking at the action, the projects, what are we doing? But I think you just have to step back and think about the big, the big idea, the, the common goal. You know, why are we all gathered here today, honestly? You know, we all care about our world, our environment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm too young to start saying things like my children in the future, but you know, I think about people my age and you know, they're gonna be growing up and um, things like that. So it, it's, it's just honestly about looking after our earth, doing the right things now for the benefit of um, the future. So just keep that, keep your mind on that common goal. Yeah. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to mention something I probably should have sa said before. We've talked about the why and the what so far, but another benefit, apart from just the benefit of sustainability and looking after our world, is of taking these kind of actions, you grow a student's and a staff member's understanding of how to work with others, how to lead, how to communicate, and how to take action on things that matter to them. And that's something I really wanted to do with the ISP, is to not just get actions done in a school, but to grow a student's understanding so that when they leave school and enter the workforce, they can make a broader difference in the world and throughout their whole life. And so it's really down to the actions we take today make a big difference tomorrow. Well, I think you'd all agree we have some inspiring leaders on the panel today. Can we please give a big thank you to Holly and Will for their leadership when it comes to being in the school and trying to make sure that they're giving students an opportunity to be part of this. But in particular to Henry and to Ned, who are absolutely inspiring. And I think what struck me most today is not only are you passionate, but you've taken the next step to actually understand, do the research and then find access Action that produce outcomes and that's going to leave you in good stead so thank you so much for all that you're doing we have some wonderful exhibitions here today from our schools right across Burundara really encourage you to get along have a chat with the students we've got some more Campbell grammar students down the front here thank you all for tuning into this panel and please thank again Holly Will Ned and Henry